So today we're going to be looking at, you mean to tell me Jesus is the only way? Confused kid face. And this normally comes through an illustration. Here's this illustration here. It's right here. I promise it's right there. There it is. Consider the elephant. Oftentimes, because I, like I said, my bachelor's is philosophy, my master's is philosophy of religion, my doctoral work is all philosophy of religion as well, and I always run into these kinds of questions. And people will say to me, well, you know, let's think about it this way. So one of the ways they do this is they said, consider the elephant. They say, suppose 10 men blindfolded or blind, and you lead them to an elephant. Blindfolded, they touch different parts of the elephant. One touches the tail and says, ooh, it's a rope. One touches the tusk and says, it must be a spear. It's a horn. Somebody touches the trunk. He's like, oh, it's obviously a ginormous snake. <laughs> then you bring them all back inside, and they tell you about all the things they're feeling, and they all have a different perspective. So the argument goes is that aren't they all just describing the same reality in different ways and different perspectives? Doesn't that prove that we can have multiple truths about a single thing? And they say, well, doesn't that actually apply to all religions? Can't we say that all religions, for the most part, are the same? Just different perspectives of the same faith, the same belief system. So aren't, you all the di aren't, aren't all the different religions experiencing the same God, but just explaining it in different ways? Does it make more sense that they're all true in their own way, would be the argument? So when we go a little further into the question of whether Jesus is the only way, we find that the real issue has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with truth of Christianity. Actually, the question is concerning truth in general. Truth in general. So there are three responses. Number one, not all religions can be equally true. Not all religions can be true. If you guys are taking notes, you can follow along. Someone could say, well, that's just closed-minded. And I would reply, that's just logical. In logic and reason, contradictions cannot coexist. For this reason, when you have two apples and two apples, how many apples do you have? Four apples. If you say, well, I could have five apples, you're delusional. <laughs> you can't have five apples when you only have four, unless you believe in magic. We're not talking about magic, we're talking about logic and reason. All you can have is four apples. Now again, consider the analogy of the elephant again. We have ten men touching different parts of the same elephant. The problem is that no matter how many angles, or how many people, or how many different opinions, the truth of the matter is that the object is an elephant. Even if a person touches a trunk and thinks it's a rope, they're wrong. That might be their perspective, that might be what they feel it is, in the most real sense, they feel that's what it is, but they're wrong. This means that truth has nothing to do with us, it has nothing to do with our opinions or how we feel. If you are feeling the, tr the, the tail of an elephant and you think it's a rope, you're just wrong. If you're feeling its leg and you think that is obviously a tree, you're just wrong you got to realize that our perspectives, our opinions, and our feelings don't matter when it comes to truth. Consider the case of Pope Michael I. You guys know this Pope? You might be thinking, who is Pope Michael I? Well, he exists, and he lives in Kansas. He was voted Pope by six people, including himself and his parents. <laughs> he claims that he has been Pope since 1990, when he was like 32. He says, since the 80s, all of the popes have been heretics. So he and his five followers decided that he should be pope. So for your information, he's been acting and pontificating as pope since 1990. Without a doubt, we can agree this guy is delusional. He's not the pope. No matter how good his intentions were, he's not the pope. You can't just get six people who really like you a lot and claim to be pope. You know, if it really comes down to it, like, hey, you guys, you guys all like me? Let's, uh, let's have a vote. Can I be Pope? I bet you money. Thank you. Yeah, I saw a couple of people raising their hands. I can get at least six people to, to make me Pope. But the thing is, is that that would be delusional. I'm not really the Pope. I can't be the Pope. The Catholic Church makes Popes. Six people in their basement can't make a Pope. 
But there are many different delusions, and some are caused by medical conditions. For example, here, it's called capgrass delusion. It's, it's, a, it's actually from injuries. What happens is the wiring in your brain gets wrecked, and your visual section of your brain and the emotional section of your brain gets severed. So what happens is, is that when somebody gets hit really hard, gets into a car accident or something, they'll see people they love. They recognize the people, but they don't have the emotional connection. The emotional connection is broken. So whenever they see their kids or they see their loved ones or they see their dog that they love, they, think, they start to think that that person might be an imposter. Because I don't feel anything for that kid. That's not my kid. It looks like my kid. It acts like my kid, but I don't feel anything for that kid. But it's a delusion. It's not true. Um, others can be chemical or a product of our imagination. So for example, we have the superhuman delusion. These people believe that they have superpowers. This can be drug-induced, so somebody tripping on acid thinks they can fly. Or it can happen more honestly, like for example, if a person survives a car accident, then they survive another accident. After a while, a person can start to think, I'm special. I'm here for a special reason. I might be superhuman or delusions of grandeur. So it's not always medical. And then finally here, in the news most recently, listen to this language. This North Carolina woman was born perfectly healthy, but ever since she was little, she just felt different. Her body didn't feel like other kids' bodies. She really knew from the time she was little she was different from all of her peers. She knew that she was meant to be born blind. You're expecting me to go somewhere else with that, right? But she literally believes that she was meant to be born blind. This is called body integrity identity disorder. She found a sympathetic psychologist who recognized her need to feel right and to live her life to the fullest because her body is just not made the way she feels it should be made. He dropped drops of Drano in both of her eyes and blinded her. She is now medically completely 100% blind because she just didn't really feel like she should be, have eyesight. She's, you know, and it's sad, but she's delusional. She's completely cut off ties with all of her family and friends because they didn't support her in this decision. But here's the thing, guys. Delusions can teach us something about the world. They teach us that there is a real world. There is a real world. The reason we recognize delusion is because we are comparing delusions or our worldviews to the reality that we see in front of us. It's for this reason that we deal with logic and truth and reason first because we can't move on unless we all understand there's something to agree about. If there's no truth, then there's nothing for us to talk about. There's nothing to agree about. There's nothing to agree upon. How can we even have a conversation? Thomas Paine, he says this great quote. Thomas Paine, he wrote Common Sense. It's the pamphlet that provoked all the support for the Revolutionary War in America. And he says, to argue with a man who has renounced the use and authority of reason is like administering medicine to the dead. The point is, it's pointless. But we must ex admit that truth exists for logic and reason to exist. Without truth, we could know nothing because everything would be in constant flux. But the fact that 2 plus 2 is 4, that unicorns don't exist, Des Moines is the capital of some state that won a game, doesn't matter. Anyway, point is to believe something different from those singular truths is to believe a lie is to believe something that's false. And Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. And we are Christians. Truth is our business. We are in the truth-telling business and teaching truth. We must embrace logic and reason as believers. So that's why we said first, number one, not all religions can be true. They can't all be equally true because all different religions contradict each other. Buddhism teaches there is no God. Islam teaches that there is. Hinduism teaches there are thousands of gods. Christianity teaches there's one. They can't all be equally right because they contradict. That doesn't mean that we, that we can't respect each other, which leads to point number two here. Go to number two. All religions claim to be the right religion. 
Buddhism believes they are the right about their faith. Muslims believe they are right about their faith. Christians believe we're right about our faith. Atheists who believe in the beginning of a world they couldn't witness coming from nothing. That's faith. They believe in the religion, the faith that they have. But here's the point. All religions believe they are right, but how they go about teaching that fact determines how they see the world. For some religions, the decision to believe is a private matter. But for the Christian, we believe our faith should, be, should permeate our lives. We believe that Christ came to answer all of the religious questions that we have. And he was the example to follow. It is therefore impossible for a Christian to not wear their faith on their sleeve. Because our faith defines us. But of course, for Buddhism, it's the same thing. We can't forget. So here's a quote from Buddhism. It says, Buddha says, If we could see the miracle of a single flower clearly, how whole, our whole life would change. There's some truth to that. Absolutely. And the Buddhists believe that their faith should guide their lives. But here's the thing. They don't proselytize. They don't evangelize. And they don't try to convert people. So I've had this conversation with people before, and they say, well, that's just because they're not jerks like you people. Well, that's not true. I mean, maybe it is. It might be true we're jerks sometimes, but that's because we're human beings, not because we're Christians. The thing is, is that the real reason is not because we're jerks, it's because our faith teaches us that there's only one chance at salvation, where Buddhism, specifically, they believe that all of reality is an illusion. The purpose of life in Buddhism is to go on to nirvana, which is a very, very, very loosely like our heaven. But here's the thing. They believe in reincarnation. Reincarnation is the idea that we have multiple lives. And Buddhism teaches that you have multiple chances at that life. So within Buddhism, with, with Islam, they have the red crescent. That's like the red cross. It's the Muslim equivalent of the red cross because the Muslims... In the Quran, it says to help people who are hurt or poor. In the Bible, it says the same thing, to help the orphans and, and your neighbors. But within Buddhism, there is no red Buddha. Because they believe that everything that happens to you is a product of your past life. They believe in reincarnation. So what's it matter? It matters because we believe as Christians that we have one chance of this thing called eternity. We believe we have one chance today. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Joshua said, decide today whom you will serve. Because there aren't other days. For Christians, we've, we're vocal about our faith because we believe that our salvation is as necessary as our next meal and our next breath. We believe this matches the reality around us. We look around. We don't see multiple lives or multiple chances. It seems to us pretty clear that death is permanent. So we believe that this life is what truly matters, not the previous one. We're not going to look at our lives and go, well, I wonder what I did two lives ago to deserve this. That's just not how we see the world. Of course, we could be wrong. That's not the point. The point is, is that each religion believes it's right. It just so happens that Christians get a lot of flack because we believe that we have one shot at this thing. And we want everybody to have the opportunity to make that response and to choose Christ. It's where the most vocal oftentimes. But here's the thing, guys. How we deliver that message changes everything. This is why we talked about our attitudes a few weeks ago. We talked about how you need to come in love. You need to come in love. You guys got to read. If you, if you need a little refresher, read First Peter again. We need to make sure that we are displaying the love of Jesus through our words and our actions if we want to make a difference in the lives of those around us. Thomas Paine's quote here goes on a little further. It says, To argue with a man who has renounced the use of an authority of reason is like administering medicine to the dead or endeavoring to convert an atheist by scripture. If you look at the ministry of Paul and the ministry of Jesus, they did not go around quoting scripture at atheists. Jesus quoted scripture to believers and scribes. Paul quoted scripture to new converts and struggling Christians. But they didn't quote scripture at atheists. Why? Because they don't recognize the Bible as an authority. There's nothing wrong with quoting scripture. Quoting scripture is great. But here's the thing, guys. We have to back up and realize no one recognizes our God. 
We are his representative on the earth right now. Each religion, including, including atheism, have their own holy writings. They have their own prophets. They have their own spiritual authorities. It just so happens that we don't recognize theirs, and they don't recognize ours. Again, let me say, there's nothing wrong with quoting Scripture. Don't get me wrong. Quoting the Bible is great. It's a huge encouragement. But posting Bible verses to Facebook after the Supreme Court votes to legalize gay marriage, you're not helping the argument. You're not helping anybody to see the truth of the matter. They don't know you. How did Jesus and Paul and all of the apostles do it? By building relationships. They went and told the hard truth to their friends. They didn't just hold up signs and protest because no one gets converted by that. There's no love in that. You can't tell somebody, I love you so much with a sign that says, I hate you. Right. You consider Richard Dawkins. He's the prophet of the atheist world. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. I don't recognize this guy as a prophet. This, is, this, this statement here is full of logical holes. The guy obviously failed intro to philosophy. Somebody putting this on their Facebook page is not going to make me go, oh my gosh, this whole Jesus thing, what was I thinking? <laughs> Richard Dawkins said that. Well, I better rethink my whole entire deal. But the thing is, are you convinced? No. But remember, the non-Christian, they don't see the Bible as an authority. They are just as equally not convinced by your scripture. The thing is, is that, not that there's anything, again, nothing wrong with quoting scripture, but the thing is, why are you quoting scripture? I think oftentimes as Christians, we throw a Bible verse out because it's easier to throw a Bible verse out than to put ourselves out. It's easier for us to say, Oh, well, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Oh, and all these different Bible verses talking about Jesus and God and all the love. God is love and all this stuff. But the thing is, is how do people actually know love? They feel it. They see it. And if you're not willing to step out and hold somebody's hand, put your arm around them, mourn with them, laugh with them, live with them, they don't know love. You can't just do that. You can't just throw Bible verses out and then try to go, oh, well, God's word never comes back void. You have not done your due diligence. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus lived with his 12 disciples. He talked with people. He met with non-believers. He didn't hide behind scripture. Jesus didn't teach us to quote scripture at non-Christians. He taught us to love on non-Christians, to provide for the poor, if I remember correctly, to live a life that's holy and good. To set ourselves apart. That's the, what the Christian is supposed to be doing. Paul didn't say, quote, scripture and expect God to deliver converts. Paul says, if possible, live at peace with everyone. That's a huge difference. You guys, if you have an atheist neighbor and you go over there, you bring them cookies, introduce yourself, have them over for dinner, have a conversations, have a fire, hang out, you're going to make way more progress towards giving them the gospel than you would have leaving a pamphlet on their, on their doorknob saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> repent, sinner, you're going to burn in hell. Your loving neighbor, Josh. <laughs> it's not going to work. We're called to live our faith and tell people about it, not to hide behind quotes and slogans. That's my, I'm so scared for the Christian who thinks that they're doing the right thing when they're actually hiding because they're scared to step out and be a Christian. The point is that when somebody says, what would Jesus do? By definition, you have to care what Jesus did. Doesn't matter how many bracelets you wear, you're not converting anybody. Buddhists do not care what Jesus did because they don't care about Jesus. But if we live lives that are good and right, those around us, living around us, will see our faith and the peace that we have. And maybe, just maybe, then we'll earn the right to speak truth into their lives. 
It's so hard for us. To speak truth into somebody's life takes building a bridge. It takes earning trust. And we have to be earning that trust as Christians. We believe that Jesus is the only answer. We believe that we're right. The thing is, all religions believe they're right. The real question is, does Christianity really answer the questions about the world and human existence better than other faiths? I believe it does. That's why I'm a Christian. Third, Jesus said he was the only way. Why do we believe Jesus is the only way? Because Jesus said he was. Just as there is one answer to the question of why the sky is blue or why most leaves are normally green, Jesus claims there's only one answer to the question of what religion is true. Jesus. Jesus tells us that he's the only door to heaven. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. And, and will come in and go out and find pasture. He's the only way to access eternity. He's the single door. And people say it's closed-minded. But if we were... Demand, if we're demanding the right to believe that a red light doesn't mean stop, does anybody go, wow, the government's really closed-minded about that? If you guys pull up to the stoplight and go, you know what? I don't think red means stop. I think it means go. That's my opinion. Who are they to tell me what I should think, what truth is? We would say they're delusional. There's only one right answer for the red light. Stop. We're not being closed-minded by claiming that there's one single truth. That's not closed-minded. We're just being logical. We're just being honest with how we feel and how we think. The thing is, so why do people get so upset when you say that Jesus is the only way? Bottom line is because it hurts our feelings. It hurts our feelings. It can't be because it doesn't make sense because the fact of the matter is that most questions have one answer. So it does make sense. It can't be because Jesus claimed to be the only answer because all religions claim to be the only answer, to know the truth. It has to be because it hurts our feelings. We want to decide what's true for us. When it comes to the metaphysical and spiritual world, we want to believe that our opinion matters. I want to decide what's true for me. The problem is, is that Christians and non-Christians alike, you can't decide which, what is true. You can decide to either believe the truth or deny it. That's a different thing. But your opinion doesn't matter when it comes to 2 plus 2 equaling 4. It's either true or it's not. We can have our own opinions, for example. You could have your favorite ice cream. You could have your favorite sports team, the Hawkeyes. Go Hawkeyes. But... You can have your favorite car, but the thing is that you might love the Hawkeyes. That's your opinion. That's awesome. It's good. But you can't have an opinion about the molecular structure of a diamond. doesn't matter what you think. It is what it is. The diamond, the truth, of the physical truth of a diamond is what it is. It has nothing to do with your opinion. You can say, oh, well, I don't believe that. I believe that diamonds are like cereal. It's like, okay, we'll chew on some. <laughs> and see how that works. The truth of diamonds will break your teeth. The problem is when it comes to religion, truth claims, we think that, we think that tr our truth claims, we have opinions. But the bottom line is that you, don't have, you can have an opinion, but you might be right or wrong when it comes to truth. And Jesus made the claim that he was the only way. When Jesus was announcing the time of his death, the disciples didn't understand they didn't understand that Jesus was dying for the sin. They, they didn't understand that he was dying for the sins of the world. They understood that they were guilty of wrongdoing. They understood they were sinners. They understood that they needed to be saved. But they didn't understand that Jesus was going to take that punishment that we all deserve. So Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He makes it very clear to them. You guys think about it. If you love your kids and your kid asks you a question, would you make it as clear as physically possible what the answer is? Of course you would. You wouldn't make it vague. You would tell them the truth. But before we become arrogant, we Christians need to step back 
and realize that Jesus didn't come to just die. Jesus came to set an example for us, to set an example for our lives and throughout the Gospels. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus explains in this next verse, says, you know the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them. And the men of high position ex exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. Talking about atheists, non-believers. They're being, non-Christians are being lorded over by the authorities that they recognize. They're telling them what to think. They're telling them how to think. And Jesus says, you guys know this is true. They're being dominated. It's not supposed to be like that for you. Christian, we're supposed to be encouraging people to think. We're supposed to be bringing the truth and letting people decide for themselves. Jesus says, on the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must quote scripture at people. No, he says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. That's the example. To serve to love on people, to show them that they matter. Men, if you want your wife to know that she's loved, do something around the house for her. That's my wife. If, I, if, if my wife comes home and, I, and I'm vacuumed to the house and clean the kitchen, there's a smile on her face. I know what you like. <laughs> Service shows love. This is not a message for non-believers. Christian, we're in a church. This is a message for us, Christians. We are to be the most compassionate. We're supposed to be the most peaceful, the most loving. We believe that we have the truth, and we are to live as though that is true. We, re we have to recognize the truth. We recognize the fact that the world is missing the God that created it. It's a big responsibility. We're not here to deliver our message through anger and malice, but through peace and justice and service, as Jesus did. You want to be great? Serve. Because that's the example that Jesus set. So in the end, bottom line is, if you look at this here, first of all, not all religions can be true. Logically, contradictions can exist. If you believe that contradictions can exist, you're delusional. If you can believe that you exist and not exist at the exact same moment, you're crazy. If you believe that red lights can also mean go or stop, you're wrong. That's a contradiction. It can't mean go and stop at the same time. Logically, that's false. Second, all religions claim to be true. The claim to truth is not purely a Christian phenomenon. All religions, including atheism, claim to understand the world better than other views. All of them. It's not just us. And third, we believe Jesus is the only way because this is exactly what Jesus said. We believe in Jesus. We believe what he said was true. We believe in God of the Bible. We have faith in Jesus and an invisible God. The Buddhists believe in reincarnation. The atheists believe that everything came from nothing. If that's not magical thinking, I don't know what is. We all believe these tenets of our faith wholeheartedly. We all live our lives accordingly, and none of us can experience or witness this belief. We're therefore all believing in something we can't see. In the end, the question is not, how can Jesus claim to be the only way? The real question is harder than that. It's deeper than that. Look at the reality. Physical world here. The molecular structure of a diamond is made of, does anybody know? It's pure carbon. If you don't think that, you're wrong. Is that close-minded of me to think you're wrong about that? No, because it's true. doesn't matter what your opinion is. The physical world, truth reigns in the physical world. In the abstract world, math follows logic and reason. 2 plus 2 equals 4. The square root of 144 is? Jeepers, you guys. I had to look that up. <laughs> I use a calculator. Give me a break. Shh. 
Bring it down. Wisconsin? Okay. You guys are throwing me off. Abstract world. Don't talk to me up here. Abstract world. Logic and reason. 2 plus 2 is 4. 144. Square root. 12. Doesn't matter what your opinion is. If you say, hey, what's square root of 144 and you say 11, you're wrong. If you insist that you're right, you're delusional. You're wrong. But here's the thing. Christian, non-Christian alike. Physical world. Abstract world. If there is a spiritual world, use your logic and reason. Does it make any sense whatsoever to believe opinions don't matter, opinions don't matter? Now they do. Truth exists, truth exists, now it doesn't. That makes no sense. If we're going to be having a conversation, let's use our logic and reason so we can come to a conclusion together. The conclusion is truth exists. In the abstract world, in the physical world, in the spiritual world, truth exists. It's a matter of each individual person has to decide what truth they're going to believe in. The real question is, based on the fact that truth exists in the physical realm, that truth reigns in the abstract world, why logically could you even begin to believe that our opinions or our feelings matter when it comes to the truth of the spiritual world? That's a better question. Answer me that. Logically, it doesn't make any sense to hold that reason and truth matter if it doesn't matter in the spiritual world. Of course, you can still choose to believe that your feelings can determine truth, that your opinions can be just as valid as math or science, but to be honest with you, that's just a journey into delusion that I'm not willing to follow you in. Christians believe that Jesus died for our sins. We believe that every single person knows that they're guilty. Everybody from the smallest kid to the biggest adult breaks a rule, lies to their parents. They do something wrong. And the thing is that Christians, we know that we can't go back in time and correct it. We can ask for apologies. We can say, hey, I'm sorry. We can say, I'm sorry I got drunk and I drove my car and I killed your kid. I'm sorry that I did drugs with your son and now he's overdosed. I'm sorry that I've done this. I'm sorry that I've done that. But the bottom line is you can't go back in time and correct it. Nothing you can do can make it right. We need a transcendent God beyond time and space to die, to suffer, to give his life, to take the punishment we deserve, to cover the sins of a lifetime. You're not eternal. God is. We need that God. And Jesus Christ came to the earth as a man, suffered, was tempted, understood what every single one of you is going through. And he still lived a life that was holy. And despite us, died for us. Despite us, suffered for us. Despite us, went on the cross, looked down and said, God, forgive them. Because they don't even know what they're doing. If that's not love, I don't understand what love is. The Christians, we can't see God. The Buddhists can't see reincarnation. The atheists can't recreate the world from nothing. So based on the evidence, we all believe in something we can't see. But I'll tell you guys, based on the evidence and all the options and all the things that I could believe, I still believe Christianity is the most true and makes the most sense. Amen. So guys, again, we have these, four, these next four questions are coming up. These are the next four questions. If God is love, why does Christianity cause all these world wars? What do Jehovah's Witnesses believe? How can you believe the Bible when it is full of myths and contradictions? And how is the world going to end? How is the world going to end? But how do Jehovah's Witnesses believe, Christians? This is for us to take a moment to realize how we can talk to people that come to our door. How many of you guys answer the door when Jehovah's Witnesses come up? I do. Especially the Mormons. They're my favorite. But I love talking to people, you guys. And we're going to talk about what they believe and how we can talk to them. Because they're human beings and they need the truth just as much as everybody else. You guys, this series here is not just for you. It's not just for your friends and family. But it's for us to understand that we are Christians because it makes the most sense. 
We're not Christians because our parents raised us to be Christians. We're Christians because at some point in our lives, we looked at the evidence and we said, I believe that. If your parents raised you to be a believer, praise God. At some point, you got to step back and go, I agree with my parents. I agree with them. Not because they told me to believe, but because it's right and it's true. And that's what the whole purpose of this series is, guys, is for us to grasp the truth of our faith and to help others to come to the same saving grace and salvation that we take for granted, to be honest. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, Lord, and thank you so much for giving us minds to think, to reason. The only thing, Lord, that separates us from the animals is our ability to think, and I pray, God, that you would help every single one of us to use our minds Galileo said that I can't believe in a God who would give us a mind and have us forego its use. And Lord, we agree. Please help us to know how to think. Help us to know how to answer questions and help us to have the humility to admit when we don't have the answer. But I pray, Lord, that while we're doing that, we'll be doing it in love. So even though we might, have not, we might not have the right answer at the right moment, that Lord, you, your love would shine through and that that person would know we care about them. Lord, we care about the non-believers in this world. And we're not looking to win arguments. We're looking to win souls. And we thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.